Thanks for joining us again tonight. This is, I think, episode eight of Elk Talk Live. And uh, we got a few questions we didn't get to last week, but this week we went and shot out a bunch of YouTube videos uh, at the request of Leupold, at the request of Botech, uh, the great folks who are making this possible. And uh, we're gonna start with the kind of the substance of those videos that we shot this week. So before we get started, Remember, if you want to be notified and you want to be in the prize drawings that we have each month, you want to text Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, to 313131. And in Canada, text Randy to 393939. And hopefully you're watching this on the Facebook page of Botech or Leupold or Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. So anyhow, you see this? This is a Leupold RX-1200 TBR rangefinder. So often, People buy El Cheapo range finders, and here's what happens. The pulse comes out here and it bounces back and it gets received here. Well, you've also got a crosshair on your, your viewfinder. There are range finders out there where the, the laser pulse goes to the left or to the right or up or down from where your actual crosshair is. So I'm gonna show you how you can check that. So back here, you see this telephone pole? So there's nothing but sky behind it. So the only way I'm gonna get a reading is when it hits the pole. So I take my normal uh, vertical position of it and I hold the button down and I just go from right to left. And boom, as quick as I, my crosshair hits the pole, I get a reading that says 62 yards. Now, if I got a reading before I got to the pole or once my crosshair crossed the pole, and was on the left side, you would know that the laser is going at a different uh, angle than what the, the viewfinder says. Then you turn it 90 degrees and you do the same thing and this will tell you if it's shooting high or shooting low. So, boom, 62 yards again, same thing. So if you have a range finder, go out and do this simple test. Because if people say, well, what difference does it make? All right, let's say that your beam is going slightly left, just a couple degrees from that deer that's out there at 40 yards. You put the range finder on his chest and the beam actually goes right in front of him and bounces back from a tree 10 yards behind. Your range finder said that deer was 50 yards instead of 40. Odds are you're gonna shoot right over the top of him. So alignment and uh, sighting in, whatever you want to call it, of your rangefinder is super critical. Don't overlook it. If you have a quality rangefinder like this one, not going to be a problem. If you have one where you thought, boy, that's a good deal on a rangefinder, uh, odds are you, uh, you might have a problem with alignment. So now we're going to go back in my shop and we're going to talk about the other uh, YouTube video we did this week about arrow spinning to look for imperfections in your arrow. So follow me, we're gonna try to go slow. One of the things we did this week is we throttled down the, uh, the feed uh, to slightly lower resolution because last week we we're trying to go as high res as possible and our remote connections were, they weren't spooling fast enough. So we just throttled it down a little bit. Hopefully this works. <clears throat> All right. So, most of you know what I'm holding in my hand here. It's an arrow spinner, right? So, a couple weeks ago, I was out here and I had my group of four arrows. And out at my range, I can shoot from anywhere 70 yards out if I want to. And three of them were just going perfect. And, yeah, that arrow is perfect. Yeah, that arrow is perfect. Yeah, that arrow is perfect. And the arrow that was bad a couple weeks ago, I threw out, but I went and dug out another one. I don't know if you can see how bad this one is. I hit a piece of rebar that holds up one of my uh, targets. But, and this is really gonna be amplified when I spin this thing. You see what's happening there? So sometimes if you have a group that most of your arrows are in your group and then all of a sudden you got one that just takes off for whatever reason. Before you get all worried about your form or get all worried about your 
your rest or your release or your sight or whatever, go put them in an arrow spinner. We always take for granted that they're perfect. They're not always perfect. So anyhow, those are two YouTube videos we did this week. And uh, hopefully it's a couple quick tips that, that'll help you along the way. Uh, a question from last week someone had was about how do I hang the antlers that you see on my shop wall here? They asked me how I do this. So I'm gonna move all of this stuff down here and try to show how I do it. So right here, you'll see that I have these two by fours running across there. And I take a decking screw and I screw it way down in there. I've, to be able to show you really well, I've left it up high. And then what I do is on the sides, I, you can see I've got some tie wire screwed in around, uh, I don't even know what kind of screws these are. They look like, they're not a sheet metal screw, but they're about an inch and a half metal screw. And so then I can just put that over the, uh, the decking screw and it hangs there. Obviously, when it's up on the wall, it's going to hang differently. So I don't use any of the commercial grade uh, antler hangers or skull hangers or whatever. Uh, I spend my money on hunting gear and hunting. So uh, let's see what else we got. So today we've changed this up. Marcus is reading the questions today and uh, Michael's running the camera. I'm trying to get my... Uh, my feed work in here. You got one, Marcus? All right, one, one question we had was, oh, I gotta turn my volume down. You guys are gonna get an echo. Oh, someone asked, uh, let's see. Clarence asks, how well does your rangefinder work in light fog or break of light? Uh, the loophole ones work great. Uh, it, one thing that you'll notice is if you have a diminished target, uh, your pulse comes out of the rangefinder at 300 to 600 pulses a second. And if you go do this in really bright light, we did this video also, and it, we're going to post it pretty soon. If you have a white target versus a black target, white reflects light. Black absorbs light. So on lower end rangefinders that don't have all the compensating uh, arrangements that the Leupold ones have, that white will bounce back with a really strong signal and your rangefinder will think it's closer. And even if there's a black target right next to it, because the black absorbed light and the light comes back at a weaker pulse, it'll think that black target is a lot further away. It'll do the same thing if the light gets diffused by the sun. It'll do the same thing if you have fog or other problems. So sometimes you think you're getting a deal on a rangefinder and uh, you didn't get much of a deal. All right. Cool to see, let's see. What weight of pack do you recommend using while training? Uh, I use a really heavy pack. Uh, no, I don't really. Uh, when I'm training, I usually have a bunch of water in there and that's it. I, I, when I'm hiking the hills down here, I think I have usually about 20, 25 pounds in my pack is about it. Uh, let's see, what is a good grain for arrows when hunting elk, uh, Justin? Uh, for me, I use 125 grain. Uh, you know, everyone's going to have a little different opinion on that. For me, I use 125 grain fixed broadheads or fixed blade uh, broadheads. Uh, when you're on a pack in hunt, what is your meal meal routine? Uh, <laughs> bad. <laughs> right now, I got all my summer weight on. I feel terrible because I've been so busy on the road this summer. I haven't been working out as much as I should. Uh, but I always got to eat breakfast. I usually have some sort of protein like a uh, trail mix that has cashews, probably some chocolate, other stuff to get me through the day. Uh, I usually have some sort of snack bar. And then at night I have to eat a really high calorie, uh, powerful meal. And when we're backpack hunting, we don't have a lot of time. So on my backpack hunts, I'm usually losing anywhere from five, usually average about five pounds on each of those hunts. Gain it back when we're off the road or in between hunts. and just fluctuates. Uh, James asks, elk sanctuaries, how steep and rugged is too steep and rugged? Uh, well, that, that depends. Uh, so let's assume this is how steep it is. But if there's one little bench there 
and then it breaks really steep again, they'll bed right on that bench. So the, the bedding location, uh, I've read research that says an elk doesn't want to bed on a spot that's more than 20 degree slope. So it doesn't matter how steep it really is, it's can they find one of those bedding spots they want. Uh, in sanctuaries, we're talking stuff that's steep as possible, ugly and nasty as possible, but still gives them the opportunity to have some bedding areas. So, uh, let's see. What do you got, Marcus? Anything? Um, Andrew asked if, or how close will you take a four wheeler to where the elk are? Oh, yeah, I don't know. Can you hear that? Or, oh, are you mic'd up? No. no? Oh, we got the remote. Okay. So, someone asked, how close will I take a four wheeler to where the elk are? Not very close. I don't. Once I've located elk and I know they are there, the last thing I want to do is scare them by driving an ATV too close. There's study after study that says elk will hear ATVs and move away. I don't care if it's in the daylight, if it's in the dark, I'll, I'll park my truck. My truck ends up serving as my ATV most of the time. And it has the scars and scratches that, that demonstrates that. But for me, most of, of the time, I'm going to park at least a mile from where I know the elk are. I just don't want to bump them. I've worked really hard to find them. Remember, I keep saying you spend 90% of your time looking for the elk and 10% of the time trying to kill them. Once I find them, I don't want to screw it up by just saying, oh, I don't want to walk that mile today. No, I'll walk that extra mile. Uh, let's see. Uh, ever hunt North Idaho? No, I haven't. I'm not tough enough. <laughs> you guys who, uh, who hunt North Idaho, that's a special kind of steep, a special kind of ugly. And if you are consistently killing elk on the public lands of North Idaho, you are, you are, that, that's a serious accomplishment. It's just that tough of hunting. All right. <clears throat> How many miles a day do you hike when training for the season? For me, it's not about miles. It's about hours spent. I usually push myself for about two hours. Uh, and to try replicate hunting, I will hike really fast for about five, 10 minutes, and then I'll just go to a regular hiking pace. And then I'll hike really fast again for five or 10 minutes and go to a regular hiking pace. Because when I'm chasing elk, whether it's with a rifle or a bull, it's not like I'm just always hmm, same pace all the time. I wanna get my heartbeat, I wanna get my cardio, my vascular, everything going to a certain level that that replicates hunting. So I do it for about a two hour stand. So you got another one? Yeah, uh, when hunting lower elevations, such as the Missouri River breaks, yeah. how important are thermals very, versus, high, versus high elevations? Right. Is it a um, it's still gonna be very important because when you hunt low elevation places, especially in archery season, the elk are gonna go where the shade is. And where's the shade? It's a different place from the bright sun. Well, you're going to have a wind in one place in the bright sun, and then the slopes that give you shade are going to have a wind that's anywhere from 180 to 60 degrees different. You cannot let your guard down on thermals, even in places like the Missouri Breaks or, you know, central uh, Wyoming. Uh, you just, you got to be paying attention to it all the time because elk are going to be usually in places where there is some topography. And even a hundred feet difference in elevation in a small cut or coulee is enough to create a wind change. Uh, if you have a good idea, this is Clint. Uh, if you have a good idea where the elk are, how far from their location would you camp? Spike camp or backpack camp? Again, I'm not gonna get right in on them. You've found them. Set your camp up someplace that's reasonable to all the things you need, protection from wind and weather, has water you can filter. Do not go and bump and push them. You've, you've found them, you've accomplished the hardest part of it. Don't do anything that's gonna push them. I, I mean, to have to hike a mile or two in the morning, you know, you could do that backwards in the dark. It's, it's just not worth setting up right on top of them. So, uh, let's see. Uh, last week you mentioned phone hunting apps for GPS navigation. What apps are you using? Uh, on this phone I have the GPS, uh, or the, it's called the Onyx Maps uh, hunt app system. It used to be huntinggpsmaps.com. Uh, it's Onyx Maps, and even if you're in a place without cell coverage, you can put your phone on airplane mode, and as long as you've downloaded your map before you went out there, your GPS is going to work just fine. 
So that's what I use. And there's some features to it that are amazing. The one I like the most is all of the burn information that you can stack the layers and say, oh, I want the layer that shows old burns. That's the thing that determines where I'm gonna spend a lot of my time hunting. Uh, let's see, in your opinion, what is the best state to apply for elk as a non-resident? Any of them? <laughs> Go hunting. I, I, we've done a, a YouTube video about hunt elk every year. If I'm on a limited budget, I'm gonna make sure I apply in New Mexico because it only costs the $65 refundable license. There's no point system. It's early in the season. If I don't draw, I've got other options ahead of me because I've found out in time. Then probably after that is Wyoming. A point is gonna cost you 50 bucks. And those points are worth gold in Wyoming. If you don't draw any of those, then I'm doing over the counter either in Colorado or in Idaho. So, oh, can we get a good look at your wall of fame? I don't have a wall of fame. Uh, Michael's gonna turn, that's, that's one side of it over there. Then we got another side, but, and some of them, the big one, the biggest elk, my son shot, is over in the house. My wife will not let me uh, uh, mount any critters, so. Uh, these are all public land elk, uh, multiple states. Uh, someone asked me, are you shooting the Bowtech Rain 7 this year? Uh, yeah, I am, right there. Uh, just starting to get it dialed in. I've had it for a while now. I've been playing with a few things, uh, playing with different arrow weights, playing with different arrows, arrow spine, different heads. Uh, but now I've kind of settled on going back to what I've always used. So I'm gonna start getting it really dialed in. Uh, so yeah, this is my bow for this year. And uh, hopefully I do, uh, I do what the bow, uh, that I meet the capabilities of the bow, let's put it that way. Uh, do you know when Onyx Maps will be re releasing their updated app pretty soon? Pretty soon. Uh, and you're going to like it. Some of us got a sneak peek. And if you want to save 20% on their app products, use promo code Randy and you're going to get 20% off. So uh, let's see. What site am I using? This site right here is a black gold. Uh, it's technically a five pin ascent. Uh, you can see the ascent. You have the ability to adjust them. Uh, I don't, I lock mine down and then I just set my pins 20, 30, 40, 50. And when I'm out hunting, uh, I'm not taking shots over 50 yards, uh, usually not over 40 yards. So this here is a black gold. I've had black gold since Moby Dick was a minnow. Uh, they just, they're bomb proof. The places and things that I do to my bow and my sights and my accessories no bow should be put through what I put mine through. I'm going to go move this so I don't drop it. You got any more, Marcus? Um, okay, I have one. Uh, I will be hunting Colorado in October. If I were to kill a cow, how do I leave evidence of sex? Oh, good question. Uh, if you take the animal out whole, you don't need to leave evidence of sex. If it's a whole carcass with head and whole body and everything, but I've never got one out whole, so... I can't uh, do that. But if you look in the regulations, every state is gonna have a slightly different version of uh, what constitutes evidence of sex. So if you're gonna quarter this out or cut it in half, you have to leave evidence of sex. And with just about every state I'm aware of, the reproduction organs uh, are the evidence of sex. You have to leave it attached to one of the quarters. Carrying the head out is not evidence of sex in most states. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Someone asked, does the, does the promo code get you 20% off chips as well as apps? No, apps only. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, on average, how heavy is your day pack? I don't know, let me see. Doesn't have any water in it yet. I'm saying. 30 pounds, and it's not filled with camera gear and some of the other things that we carry as backups and accessories. So, depends on what I'm hunting for. Any doesn't have any spare clothes in it right now. Uh, we've done some bag dumps where you can see what's in that pack, uh, but it's uh, 
I'd say it runs between 20 and 30 pounds, depending on the season. Uh, let's see. I got a question for all of you people. What do you guys do with your, all of your uh, uh, ivories, whistle teeth? I got a couple bags of them here. I'm trying to figure out what to do with them. I don't know. Everyone says, oh, make jewelry out of them. As you can see, I'm not much of a jewelry guy. And if I went and got something made for my wife, she'd probably say, that's not my version of jewelry. Get them out of here. Those are parts of a dead animal. So, oh, new walleye boat. Uh, no, that's my wife's walleye boat. It's, uh, <laughs> Steve, <laughs> you North Dakota guys. Uh, I, uh, my wife is a walleye fishing nut. So in the summer, I have to walleye fish. I know some of you are saying, gee, Randy, you have such a tough job. You have to hunt all fall and fish all summer. I know. Someone's got to do it. But anyhow, <clears throat> we're partway through here. Uh, just a reminder, if you want to be in the drawing for prizes, text Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, to 313131. You'll get in the drawings, and you'll also be notified anytime we're going to go live because we're going to... In this, the future here in the fall, if we can work out all the technology, you're going to start seeing us go live at some surprise times. You might hear Randy say, in the dark, in the morning, there's a bull bugling right down there. Tune in in about an hour, and we'll tell you what happened. So you might want to be on that text list so that you'll get notified. Uh, and if you like these, please share your questions, your thoughts, your ideas with us. Uh, comments if you like them. Uh, and also share it with your friends. Uh, the more people that are watching this, the better for everyone else. And we're just trying our best to give, I guess, information that lowers the hurdles to make everybody feel that, you know what, elk hunting is something you can do. I grew up in northern Minnesota. I couldn't even dream I would someday be an elk hunter. It seemed like something only billionaires do. Now, because of this great country we live in, I get to go out on the public land between my tags and friends I go on six to eight elk hunts a year between me and friends. Go and do it. That's, that's the whole point of this. Archery season, rifle season, whatever you like, go and do it. Marcus looks like he's got a good one here. Yeah, so someone has a rifle elk hunt in Idaho, September 15th. Rifle and elk hunt in Idaho, September wolf, 15th. There's wolves in the area. Wolves in the area. Will the elk still be bugling? Yes. That's been my experience. I, I mean, here in Montana where I hunt, uh, I've hunted a lot in places where there are lots of wolves. I mean, elk still got to do what they got to do. So I, uh, I know a lot of people will say, oh, the, the wolves chased the elk away, the wolves ate all the elk, whatever. Yes, wolves have an impact. And yes, wolves have probably relocated some of the regional habits of how elk interact with the landscape, but the elk are still there. Go find them and go hunt them. And, you know what? Buy a wolf tag if you're in Idaho. It, I think they're like 20 or 30 bucks. So have one in your pocket in case you want to shoot one if you see one. So, oh, what else we got? Uh, would you use a 6.5 Creedmoor on elk? Looking at it for a deer gun and just curious if it would be a good mid-range elk gun. Um, I would if, if pressed into action, but I'd have to be very, very disciplined in the shot angles. Uh, my shot distances, and I wouldn't do it without anything other than the highest quality bullets, which for me, when I think elk bullets, I'm thinking a Nosler Partition or a Nosler Acubond. Anything else, I, I wouldn't do it, I, especially if I have larger cartridges available to me. So, What do we got, Marcus? Scott Jones asks, do you use any of that Trick Reno scent cover-up stuff? <laughs> so those of you who watch our show know that Scott Jones is sandbagging me because Scott's been on a few episodes and he knows my thoughts on scent products. Uh, Scott laughs at me because when people start talking about scent products, I'm like, what a waste of money. And the reason I say that is elk hunting is a very active hunt. You're hiking, you're running, you're climbing. Our, we're uh, out on our YouTube channel right now. We're posting a day-by-day -day hunt with me and Corey Jacobson. It's from last year. I think it's going to be nine or 10 days before it's all done. And in that hunt, we did 84 or 87 miles in those days in hot weather. You cannot manage scent in that type of environment. If you're going to be moving to where the elk are, you're going to be sweating. You're going to be doing everything else. 
You, unless you can somehow cover up your breath. And when you think about it, if you are upwind of an elk, the game's over. It doesn't matter if you had the best scent products in the world, an elk is not going to stand there if you got upwind. So even if you had the best scent products in the world, if you're upwind of them, he's going. And just, sorry. <laughs> I'm sure I'm never going to get a sponsorship from, from one of the scent product companies, but that's who I am. If I think something isn't going to work for how we hunt, I'm going to tell you that. And there's no amount of love or money that's going to get me to use it. So, all right. What else we got here? Uh, where do you set up your base camp when elk hunting in Colorado? Uh, it, that's a good question because a lot of people think we do backpack hunts and we go and we set up right on a herd of elk. A lot of times I will go and set up a base camp that gives me within probably 15 to 30 minute drive, no more than that, multiple options. So there's a trailhead out there, there's a trailhead out there. I'll set up a base camp somewhere that gives me close access and then I'll see, I'll let the elk kind of tell me where they're at and what they're doing. So I might go to that trailhead the first day, that one the second day, and I'll start dialing in. Oh yeah, the elk are kind of over there. And that's probably where I'll start spending most of my time. But once you go in and you set up a base camp or a, a, a spike camp or a, a backpack hunt, you're kind of planting your stake that there are going to be elk here and there might be, but if there's not, Man, that makes for a tough, lonely, long hunt. Makes for some really boring TV also. Uh, what do you got, Marcus? All right, someone has a Northern Colorado second season take. No, Northern Colorado second season for elk. If it's warm, will the elk be in heavy timber? If it's warm, will the elk be in heavy timber? They will be somewhere where it's cooler. That's gonna be on north facing slopes, northeast slopes, down in canyons. Maybe there's a little bit of snow from an early snowstorm that didn't melt off. Yeah, they're gonna be in places that make them cooler and sometimes it'll be that heavy timber. But a lot of times they're not gonna be a mile into that heavy timber. If this is a big batch of heavy timber, they might be in the first 300 yards of it because then at night they can quickly come out and feed. They can feed until right when the sun comes up and then they come back in there. So yeah, look for them where it's gonna be cooler. An elk spends as much of uh, um, as much energy thermal regulating at 70 degrees as they do trying to stay warm when it's 20 degrees. Yeah, it's hard on them. So, all right. What do you use to cook grouse out in the backcountry? A stick and a fire. Salt and pepper and some butter? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just put them on a stick and put them out there. But I will tell you, there's a, the seasoning. I do carry a little bit of it sometime if I know we're going to be back there. It's made by Dog Day Spice Rubs. Uh, I just carry a little bit of it and you put that in there and grouse over an open fire. Oh man, we're doing a grouse. Uh, in, the, in the next couple of weeks, we just filmed it today. Uh, an episode about how to clean a grouse. Because I filmed it last fall or the fall before, but we've never done anything with it. So we're getting it ready to go. So you'll see what I do with grouse. Uh, let's see. What size and how many coolers does it take for an elk? Uh, right here, I'm sitting on a pair of 65 quart Orion coolers. Uh, for elk, I usually use 85s. You gotta bone them out. You're not gonna fit hindquarters in anything other than a cooler about the size of your freezer. Uh, and when I'm out, I will usually have two 65s and two 85s. And that will usually get me through a, an efficiently trimmed and boned elk. Uh, it's just the way I've been able to, to sort it out and make it work. What do you got over there, Marcus? Oh, here's a, here's a good one, James. How much snow pushes bulls to lower elevation? You would be surprised how much snow it takes to push an, a bull elk to low elevation. Cows and young bulls, yeah, they'll move earlier. It, it takes a lot of snow, like up to the, their belly and deeper before some of those big old mature bulls will head out. Cold will push them sometimes more than snow will. As long as the snow is something they can dig through, They'll stay up there and tough it out. But if it gets super, super cold and there's a crust on the snow and they can't get any food, they gotta go lower to where they can get to food. What, what are, are your grouse tips of choice, arrow tips? 
my grouse arrow tips of choice. Uh, <laughs> let me see, I got them around here. Oh, well, here's one of them. I don't know if you can see all the nicks and scratches and, and pieces shot out of that. <laughs> this this uh, Magnus Stinger has shot so many grouse. It's dull as, I mean, the end of my thumb is as sharp as this is. But a lot of times I've left the truck without a, a grouse or a small game tip, and I end up using a broadhead. I will ruin a $12 broadhead for a grouse, Don't, no doubt about it. Uh, but I use some of the small game heads and I use judo points also. I, I have one around here somewhere, but I, I don't have it handy, so. Oh, let's see. Starting point to find late season bulls. North slopes, east slopes, elevation, clear cuts, tips for identifying a sanctuary. We've done a whole bunch of videos on this out on our YouTube channel, so I'm gonna be really uh, abbreviated here. Sanctuaries are the places you walk up to and say, I don't wanna haul an elk out of there, or I don't wanna have to climb up there to find an elk. Odds are you found a sanctuary. It's places other hunters don't wanna go. We did a whole series of e-scouting uh, out on our YouTube channel and gets into all detail of this. Go and watch that and uh, you'll, you'll see kind of how we do it and, and how we locate the places on the map. Uh, let's see. About your meat allergies, have you heard of... Uh, no, I've, uh, I've not heard about... Uh, it's alpha-gal allergy transmitted by the Lone Star Tick. Hmm. No. Have you heard of it, Marcus? Or, oh, really? Huh. Never heard of it. And I don't have meat allergies. I have dander allergies to elk, deer, antelope, and also their blood. So whatever's in their blood and dander, it uh, causes me problems. How long does it take for a burn area to become a good elk area? Sometimes the same year as the burn. If it burns in July and you get monsoon rain in September, by late September and October, you'll see little green sprouts like that and the elk will be in there just mowing it down. Usually, if not the first year, or not that year, within a year, you can count on it. Unless it's a super high intensity burn, usually within a year, it's gonna be good. How many trips does it take you to pack out a bull? How many trips does it take to pack out a bull? Depends on how bad I wanna ruin my body. Uh, I used to be of the mindset that I only wanna take as few trips as possible. Now I usually take a hind quarter as a trip, so that right there's two trips, and then usually take a front quarter, uh, a back strap, a tenderloin, and some of the trim as another trip, and then off the other side. So right there is about four, four loads. And then usually, as you can see, we do a lot of European mounts. Usually I bring the head out. I'm, it's always at least four heavy loads. I sometimes will spread it out to a, a fifth load and just make it so that each load isn't nearly as bad as it could be. And sometimes if it's a big bowl and there's a ton of trim and everything is just bigger, I might say, you know what, I'm gonna do a sixth load. So if it's me and a camera guy, uh, that's three round trips. If it's me and two camera guys, uh, then it's two round trips, depending on how much camera gear I've got them loaded down with. But they're younger than I am, so I don't worry about that stuff. All right. Someone answered here, they take four pack loads, so they're not 50 some years old like I am. Once you get to be older, your back and your knees say, you know what, how about you just take another afternoon and get that in a, a, a bit smaller loads. So, uh, let's see, do you, will you hunt a wallow in October? Not usually, uh, reason being they're usually not using them in October, been my experience. Uh, any tips for hunting elk in the rut on smaller sections of land instead of national forest? Yeah, use boundaries as your, your uh, ally. Uh, say this is public and this is private. Both the private hunters and the public hunters will usually stay away from those boundary areas because the private guy, he doesn't want to push the elk over to public. So the elk kind of feel comfortable in kind of this either side of the, the boundary. And then the public guys, they don't want to hunt too close because if they shoot something, then it jumps the fence. My neighbor's airplane is buzzing us right now. Sorry about that. When you live out in the country in Montana, you got crop dusters and you got neighbors who their commute is their little uh, Cessna or Super Cub. But 
Anyhow, the public hunters don't want to push the elk over to private, so they won't hunt there. We did a whole YouTube video on using boundaries as your ally. That's how I hunt those smaller sections. How are we doing, Marcus, time-wise? Yeah, we're like 30, 40. Batteries, pretty close to dying. Battery's going to die on us? Like, <laughs> how long? I don't know, maybe five minutes. Oh, we got like five minutes Hopefully. left. On, we have this live stream hardware. It takes a lot of battery, so um, we need one really good one to wrap it up. So, How many elk tags do I have this year? Montana, Wyoming, and Arizona. Yeah, personally, I have three. Marcus has Wyoming. Uh, my buddy Jerry has Arizona. My buddy Tim has New Mexico. So we're going to be filming six elk hunts this year, as of right now. What did you have, Marcus? Uh, this kind of goes into that Wyoming elk hunt, but this person's in Idaho. What's the difference between hunting with a rifle in the rut versus hunting in the rut with a bow? Oh, someone from Idaho is asking, what's the difference between hunting with a rifle in the rut or a bow in the rut? Not a whole lot, uh, other than it's going to be a whole lot easier. Uh, I lucked out I had an Arizona rifle early elk tag in 2005 in Unit 10. Got to hunt last week of September. It was crazy. I, I mean, it's, just, it's almost not fair. I'm going to be in Arizona this year in early October with a rifle, and the rut still goes on then. So big difference in that the elk still behave the same way. It's just a whole lot easier with a rifle than it is with a bow. How many times have you called them in in archery season and they hang up at 70 yards, 80 yards, 100 yards with a rifle? Guess what? Old Pete's getting <laughs> skidded out for a victory ride. Uh, let's see. Are you hunting Nevada this year? Yeah, I am. Uh, I drew an archery mule deer tag in Nevada, and then we're going down. My buddy Mike Spitzer drew a desert bighorn sheep tag. We're going down to film that also. Uh, hmm. Opinion on using horses for elk hunting. I wish I had an opinion. I'm, I grew up in a logging family, not a ranching family. I know nothing about taking care of horses. If I had horses and mules, they'd die in neglect because I'm so ignorant about how to take care of them. So, but this year we have, I think, three hunts. We're using llamas. Bo, you're going to be there in Wyoming. I hope you haven't changed your mind. Last one, Marcus. What do you got? If the elk are not talking in archery season, how do you hunt them? If elk are not talking in archery season, how do I hunt them? I spot and stalk them. I set up on them. I glass them if it's open enough that you can glass. Uh, you just got to adapt and, and do what you can. And I can't tell you why certain periods of the day, certain days of the week, it all looks the same. Or the calendar's great. The weather's great. Why aren't they talking today, but the next morning they're talking like crazy? I don't know. But it happens. We have all experienced it. So when that happens, I go and spot and stock them. I get on their trails I, where I know they're going to come to feed or come to water or come to bed and uh, do it that way so all right folks that's uh i think that's the last question please share this with your friends if you if you would it's great for us it's great for our, uh, the companies that make this possible uh Botech archery leupold uh rocky mountain elk foundation and again if you want in on the prizes and you want to know when we're ready to go live text randy r-a-n-d-y to 313131 how are we doing guys are we out of battery? No? Well, heck, we can take, we can take another question then. We're, someone says, is that a Lund back there? Yeah, that's a Lund Pro V. Uh, I don't get anything for uh, saying that, but uh, my, for my wife, nothing but the finest. Uh, that is her boat. That is not my boat. I couldn't sell it if I wanted to. My name is not even on the title. Uh, just kind of how it goes. Oh, someone from Magdalena, New Mexico. Seth, you're from Magdalena, New Mexico. I love Magdalena, Daddle, Quamado, Pie Town. If you ever get to Western New Mexico, go to Pie Town and eat some of the pie. Really, it's, it, they've got two or three little pie shops there. Magdalena is a cool place. Uh, I'll be driving through there this year. Uh, any pronghorn tags this year? Yeah, uh, let's see. My buddy Jim has pronghorn in Wyoming. Uh, I'm going to be doing pronghorn in New Mexico. Uh, we're taking a, a person who won a sweepstakes with Onyx Maps. We're taking them to New Mexico. 
And we're next week, I think. Marcus, is it next week we find out about Montana pronghorn? If, if I do get Montana pronghorn, I'm probably going to archery hunt it. It's how my calendar works this year. Uh, how'd you get two Arizona tags? I, I, didn't, I didn't get two. I have uh, a tag, and then my buddy Jerry has a tag. So we're going to be down in October, and then we're going to be back down in December. I'm going to get a call from Arizona Game and Fish. Hey, Newberg, we heard on Elk Talk Live that you have two elk tags. No, I don't. <laughs> if, if I said that, I'm sorry. I, 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 that's not what I meant to say. But my credit card got hit this week from Arizona for a deer hunt. I'm going to be on the Kaibab hunting deer, so that's cool. Uh, all right. Stop at Daddle and look at the big snake. No, stop at Daddle and look at those mule deer at the, what is it, the eagle's nest or whatever? Two of the biggest mule deer in North America are mounted in this little gas station uh, cafe in Daddle, New Mexico. If you go there, you'll say those got to be fake. But they were shot right around there. So, All right. Bow poundage. I'm a wuss. I got in a car wreck at one time, and I can hardly bend this back 60 pounds. Uh, my wrist my left wrist. If I shoot multiple arrows, and that's why when I talk about how I practice, I only shoot five, six arrows at a time and then I rest, come back out later and do it. If I shoot 20, 30, 40 arrows just nonstop, this wrist gets so bad that it takes me three or four days before I can hardly even move it again. So, All right, you guys had enough? Michael's saying, yeah, I've had enough. He's been standing there. He's been in charge of this thing. So. All right, in the TV world, they say this is a wrap. Thanks for watching.